Orleans is a town whose history is filled with interesting events. In this presentation, we will attempt to provide you with a brief history of Orleans and a look at Orleans today. Orleans is the largest commercial center on the Lower Cape with a population of nearly 6,000 people year-round according to the 2010 census. Orleans was part of a greater East Ham until 1797, so East Ham history and Orleans history are tied together. As shown, Greater East Ham covered a very large area of the Lower Cape. We have grouped the subjects in this presentation in categories. For example, we will cover events with the seacoast as a separate subject, even though chronologically many of the events overlap with events with the railroad. Before Europeans settled the region, the Nasa Indians inhabited the area. The Nasa Indians lived in the area on Cape Cod east of the Bass River, which is near to Exit 9 on the Mid-Cape Highway. They spoke a dialect of the Algonquin tribes. There was a large village located around Nauset Harbor at the time. The first explorer to visit the Nauset area was the English explorer Bartholomew Gosnold in 1602. He gave the area the name Cape Cod because of the plentiful supply of those fish. Samuel de Champlain in 1605 was the first to spend any amount of time in the area. He spent four days around Nauset Harbor. In 1614, Captain Thomas Hunt, a British sea captain, captured seven of the Nossets and planned on selling them as slaves in Spain. Out of this capture comes an interesting story of an Indian named Squanto. Squanto was shipped to Spain where he was freed by a group of monks. He later went to England and lived there two years. In 1619, he had the opportunity to travel back to his native lands with another English explorer. In 1621, on hearing of the Pilgrim settlement at Plymouth, he meets with them. He is a great help to the Pilgrims with their crops and aiding them in making friends with some of the other tribes. The Pilgrims first came to this land in 1620. On November 9th of that year, they sighted land. They planned on reaching a settlement site near the Hudson River, so they turned south. They encountered dangerous shoals lying just a few feet under the surface. They were forced to turn north and finally anchored in Provincetown Harbor on November 11, 1620. From Provincetown, they set out in a small boat to explore the area. On December 8th, they had a small fight with the Nasa Indians at a beach now called First Encounter Beach in East Ham. The Nossets had not forgotten the abduction of some of their tribe six years before. Before this, the Pilgrims had taken a supply of corn, including seed corn they found at Cornhill and Truro, which also got the Nossets angry. On December 16, 1620, the Pilgrims sailed to Plymouth and settled there. Now we will discuss the early settlers. Some of the Pilgrims had become dissatisfied with Plymouth. They had been granted only small parcels of land. The land itself was not rich enough for raising crops. Over the years, the pilgrims had been trading with the Nossets for corn and other food and were aware of how rich the land in the area was. In 1643, the church authorized an exploration party to go to the Nossa area and determine if some of them should move there. The next year, seven families consisting of 49 people, moved to the area. They called the town Nauset, and as can be seen, there were various ways it was spelled. Nauset was the fourth town to be settled on the Cape, but it was the only one that was settled by people from Plymouth. The others were settled by people from Situate, Saugus, and the Bay Colony. Nauset was only the tenth town to be settled in the Plymouth Colony. 
As you look at the list of families that were the original settlers, you will recognize many names that are still around today, either in families or places. Let us look at some of the history of the region. Typically, early settlers to this continent named their new towns after towns in England to remind them and their descendants where they came from, and so Nauset was renamed to East Ham in 1651. Originally, East Ham included Harwich, Brewster, Orleans, Wellfleet, Truro, a small part of Chatham, and of course, East Ham. East Ham was responsible for the collection of taxes, enforcement of laws, and representation to the colonial government. This was to continue until such a time the individual towns could support a meeting house and a minister. As the towns grew and were able to assume the responsibilities of a town, they separated from East Ham. The first to separate was Harwich in 1694. Harwich included Brewster, which became its own town in 1803, over 100 years later. In 1709, Truro established its own town, and in 1763, Wellfleet did the same. The small portion of Chatham that was East Ham, became part of Chatham when it was incorporated in 1712. The final separation came in 1797 with the establishing of Orleans, Massachusetts. The naming of the town of Orleans is an interesting story. As the town was formed soon after the Revolutionary War, the anti-British sentiment was quite high, while the pro-French sentiment was quite strong. The people remembered the aid that France gave during and after the war. Isaac Snow had escaped from a British prison and spent time in France waiting to return to America. He became familiar with the name of a popular nobleman, Louis Philippe Joseph Duc d'Orléans, who later died in the Revolution. At the time the town was being formed, the Duke's oldest son came to America after being banished from France. The publicity and Isaac's memory helped to name the town of Orleans. There are some interesting events in Orleans history. The following events are certainly not all the events in Orleans history, but we selected the ones we found very interesting. During the War of 1812, the British had warships off the coast of Orleans. One of them ran aground and in trying to free the ship, the sailors threw material overboard to lighten the load with the intent of retrieving it once the ship became afloat. Some residents of Orleans retrieved some of the material and destroyed the rest. On December 19, 1814, the British landed troops with the intent of punishing the town by destroying property, including the all-important salt works. A large force of Orleans militia, aided by militia from Brewster and East Ham, forced the British to abandon their plans of destruction. During the First World War, the American general in France, General Pershing, communicated with the U.S. command in Washington, D.C. through the Marine Telegraph from France to Orleans. On July 21st, 1918, a German submarine sank four barges off the coast of Orleans in an attempt to break the cable. The attack did not disrupt service. The original road that wound down the Cape to Orleans and extended into Route 6 across the country had been called the King's Highway on the Cape. There had always been a great resentment by residents of the Cape. The signs designating the King's Highway were always disappearing. Finally, in 1937, the name was changed to the Grand Army of the Republic, named after the Union Army in the Civil War. The railroad played an important part in the region's history. In 1848, the railroad came to Cape Cod. It ran from Middleborough, Massachusetts to Sandwich. Six years later, in 1854, the railroad was completed to Yarmouth. From Yarmouth, it continued its way down the Cape and reached Orleans in 1865. 
1870, it was extended to Wellfleet. Finally, it was completed in 1872 to Provincetown and in 1887 to Chatham. For over 50 years, it served the Cape, providing passenger and freight service. It began to decline in 1920. The decline was hastened by the construction of two automobile bridges over the canal, which allowed cars to get to the Cape. Passenger rail service to the Outer Cape was halted in 1937, followed by freight some 25 years later. The buildings and rails which had deteriorated were gradually removed. In 1978, the portion of the railroad east of Dennis became the Cape Cod Rail Trail for bicycles. We will look at a few of the public services that developed in Orleans. Orleans was connected to other towns on the Cape by old Indian trails which had been widened by the early settlers. In 1720, the first highway was constructed. It ran from Harwich to Truro through Orleans. It was made as straight a route as possible and it was almost 40 feet wide. In Orleans, it ran along the west side of the cove. This picture, some 200 years later, shows the road with little change. Snow's Library was formed in 1876 with a gift of $5,000 from David Snow to the town of Orleans. David Snow started baking and selling sea biscuits to local fishermen as a young boy. He eventually dominated the salt fish trade of New England and became involved in shipbuilding, real estate, and finance in Boston. He became very wealthy. His autobiography, From Poverty to Plenty, tells the story of his success. In 1956, the towns of Orleans, Eastham, and Wellfleet formed a regional high school. In 1960, it was named Nauset Regional School District. In 1966, Brewster joined the school district. Today, the Nauset Regional School District serves Wellfleet, East Ham, Orleans, and Brewster. Each town has its own elementary school and shares the middle school in Orleans and the high school in East Ham. The school district has an excellent reputation for quality of education. The first settlers came to Orleans because of its rich soil. For years, the main industry was agriculture. After many years of overuse and misuse, the land deteriorated and agriculture declined. However, it resurged with new crops. Cranberry harvesting was big for over a century, and asparagus was a main crop in the 1920s and 30s. The early settlers also engaged in shipbuilding which provided employment and income to the community. Unfortunately, the land was stripped of its trees to build the ships. This was one of the causes of the deterioration of the land for agriculture. This photo is a good example of the barrenness of the land. Many of the occupants turned to the sea for a living by fishing and whaling. Whales were plentiful in the bay and required only small boats. The large whales disappeared in the bay and people had to find other ways to make a living. The Mayo Duck Farm was a major duck producer in New England from 1895 to 1968. The farm earned the unofficial title of Duck King of New England in 1942. With approximately 100 duck houses and 840 ducks, it produced over 50,000 ducks per year. In 1942, it added 17,000 broilers and 5,000 capons. These were sold all over New England. The process of making salt from seawater by evaporation developed in the area in the early 1800s. The salt industry was very important in Orleans. The seawater was pumped into the vats through the use of wind pumps after which it moved to the next vat by gravity. This illustration shows the process. 
The wind pumps moved the water up to the first vat. In the first vat, the sun evaporated most of the water and the liquid became more dense or saltier. Then it was moved to the next vat where the evaporation continued and some impurities crystallized out. The final stage was the crystallization of the salt. The sun and wind did the work. 250 gallons of seawater yielded about one bushel of salt, approximately eight gallons. The vats were covered in inclement weather and the covers were removed during good weather. Shortly after the Civil War, the salt works started to disappear as other sources of the mineral were developed. Orleans history is deeply involved with the sea coast. It would have been difficult to ignore the sea with the Atlantic Ocean on the east side and the bay on the west side. Shipwrecks were part of Orleans life. The first recorded shipwreck was in 1626, just six years after the pilgrims came to America. As sea traffic increased, so did the number of ships that were caught on the sandbars and outer beach. Several lighthouses were built in the neighboring towns to help guide ships. There were no lighthouses built in Orleans itself. In 1879, the French cable company landed a telegraph line on Nosset Light Beach in North East Ham. The line came from France via an island off the coast of Newfoundland. A station was built to house the equipment, but the operators and their families wanted the benefits of a larger town. In 1891, the operation was moved to Orleans and a new station was built to house the equipment. In 1898, a direct line from France to Orleans was laid in the ocean to the Orleans station. The station closed in 1959 and the building is now a museum. Today, Orleans is still strongly associated with the sea, with its fine beaches, harbor, and fishing. Some items in history are particularly interesting due to their uniqueness or at least strangeness. One of these is the story of Governor Prince. In 1657, he was elected again to the office of Governor of the Plymouth Colony, and for eight years he governed the entire colony from Orleans. When you consider the slow transportation and communication of the day and the large size of the colony, it was quite a remarkable accomplishment. In 1654, the area was overrun with wolves. A bounty was paid for the body of any dead wolf, and within two years, eight were eliminated. Compare that to these times when wolves are an endangered species. Also that year, blackbirds and crows were getting into crops and eating or destroying them. A law was passed requiring every household to kill 12 of the birds or pay a fine. Single men could not marry until they had killed six blackbirds or three crows. We are guessing that many of the single ladies participated in the hunt to help their fiancé fill his quota. We all know about the Cape Cod Canal in Bourne and Sandwich, but few people have heard of the Orleans Canal. The Indians had originally dug a small passage so they could take their canoes between the bay and the ocean. It ran from the end of Boat Meadow River to the Nauset Cove near where the traffic circle is now. Canal Road near the circle got its name from the canal. In 1717, the ditch was enlarged by the settlers. It was large enough to accommodate a boat up to 20 tons. The canal was nicknamed Jeremiah's Gutter after Jeremiah Smith, who owned a house near the canal. The canal played an important part in the War of 1812. The British Navy had blockaded the bay, so supplies could not reach the towns on the bay side. The canal allowed small boats to cross to the bay from the cove and deliver supplies. The canal went out of operation in 1823. Only traces of the canal can be seen today, but most people would not recognize it. Boat Meadow River can be seen from Bridge Road and East Ham. 
Orleans has history, but it also has many attractions. Commercially, its stores and shops supply visitors and residents alike. Summer visitors began coming to Orleans when the railroad came to Orleans. Travel by automobile made travel even easier. Tourism and part-time residents are a big part of Orleans' life. The population in the summer is more than five times that of the winter. People are attracted by the beautiful beaches on the bay and the ocean. Rock Harbor provides commercial and charter fishing as well as a place to launch and store pleasure boats. Top quality baseball is played in Orleans. The Orleans Firebirds are part of the Cape Cod Baseball League. The league consists of 10 teams of top college baseball players from all over the country. Many of these go on to the major leagues. Some of the alumni include Kevin Euclid, Jason Veritek, Jacoby Ellsbury, and Jason Bay, just to name a few of the hundreds in the majors. The league also has youth clinics during the season, and they are very popular. The games are fun to watch, great baseball, and an opportunity to see tomorrow's players today. Orleans has many historical sites to visit. The Coast Guard boat CG 36500 is famous for the rescue of 32 men from a sinking tanker Pendleton on February 18, 1952. A crew of four braved 70 knot winds and 60 foot seas to rescue the crew of the tanker. Later the ship deteriorated after it was decommissioned in 1968. It was purchased by the Orleans Historical Society in 1981 Restoration to its original condition was completed in 2009. It is now on display at Rock Harbor during the summer months. The Jonathan Young Windmill was built in the early 1700s in South Orleans. It was restored by the Historical Society and donated to the town in 1990. It now stands in Town Cove Park near the Orleans Inn. The French cable station was once the termination point of a direct telegraph cable from France to Orleans. Many significant messages, such as Lindbergh landing in Paris in 1927, came through the station. The station closed in 1959 and was opened as a museum in 1972. The Orleans Historical Society was formed in 1959 to preserve the history of the town. It is headquartered in an 1834 Greek revival structure originally built as a meeting house for the Universalist Church. It has many fine exhibits and collections in the building. Exhibits at the museum include Revolutionary War and War of 1812 relics, early photograph, paintings, and historical collections of Orleans. There is Native American collections shipwreck items, and other memorabilia. This video was made with the cooperation of the Orleans Historical Society. For more information about the town of Orleans, contact the Orleans Historical Society at orleanshistoricalsociety.org.